All right. Well, good morning, Vintage Church. Am I on? Ready to roll? Ready to, for some action in God's Word? Yeah? Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me now. All righty. So glad to see uh, or try to see each and every single one of you this morning. Uh, my name is Greg Wilton, um, and uh, I'm dean at Level College. Uh, been back to New Orleans uh, since January, and uh, delighted to be here. I'm grateful for uh, Pastor Dustin, uh, for his friendship to me, uh, what he means to me, and uh, especially what Vintage Church means to me as well. Those of you who are familiar with Vintage Church, then you guys know my brother Rob, and, um, and so uh, don't hold that against me, some of you guys in the house today. And, um, but I love my brother dearly as he is serving the Lord faithfully up at Vintage Church in Pittsburgh, and uh, just delighted to be here with you guys, you know, uh, excited to open up God's Word as we uh, continue this series called Crossover, and today we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 16, Exodus chapter 16, um, I've got a title, it's just a very plain title that I have for us today, and it's called Our Grumbling and God Providing, Our Grumbling and and God providing. You know, I'm, I'm really uh, interested in this particular passage of Scripture, especially for the fact that we're going to see this particular theme of grumbling appear. It's already appeared before, but it's going to appear here in Exodus chapter 16. And I think that there's a lot to be said about this particular topic. Uh, I, for one, am guilty of grumbling. I don't know about you guys. I don't know if that happens uh, within your world. Uh, maybe it, it has to do with uh, relationships, um, say, within your family. Maybe it's a, a, a husband and wife type of thing that takes place where there, there can be some grumbling. I know that there will be parents in the house today that say uh, behind when, when the kids are finally down to sleep or they're somewhere else, then there might be some grumbling type of activity that takes place between the parents with regard to... Um, um, you know, what's happening with the, the kids and how they can be frustrating at times. Perhaps your grumbling um, maybe is laser focused in on maybe the state of the country, uh, the state of the city, um, things of that nature. It could be related to your work. Uh, some of us are, you know, really vocal and we uh, will be glad to express our grumblings with anyone that will take a moment to just sit next to us and listen for just a second. Um, and then there might be some of you in the house today, you are a grumbler, but you are in essence a bit of a private grumbler. So you, you keep it uh, to yourself and you, you do it, but you, you, you don't necessarily uh, say that to other people. And then I will say that there are, and let me tell you something, incredibly rare incredibly rare, but you guys have met them before. Maybe there's even a few of them in the house today who really, you're wondering why they are not grumbling. And, uh, and they're just really inspirational people in that regard because uh, they have the ability to not do that. So I'm looking forward to uh, at least addressing this particular subject that we have. I pray that it will be a blessing to you uh, especially for those of, you who are, those of you who are believers here today, uh, you follow the Lord Jesus, you've given your heart and life to him. Uh, I pray that I'm asking God to do that to me as well through this particular chapter, um, and then what I'm going to share, that, that conviction would fall upon us with regard to the way in which we approach this, uh, this subject, this, this part of our lives, grumbling. Um, and then I, I hope that for those of you who maybe are not followers of Jesus, you might be here today, you're visiting, uh, you're checking this out. I hope that I will preach this, I will share this with you today, and I, and I pray that it would be a testimony to Jesus, okay? I'll, 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 I pray that you would see, um, yes, church is full of hypocrites, church is full of people who um, man, we're, we're, I want to hit it. I want to do it right. I want to do it the way that Jesus wants us to do it. And I fall short so many times. You know, some of you guys can relate to that. And I pray that those who are not believers in the house today would see that at least we, we want to be people, Christians. We want to be those kind of people who are sincerely trying to follow the ways of Jesus. 
and, uh, and that ultimately what you hear then with regard to even the subject of grumbling, it points you to why we follow Jesus, why we see and savor him as the one who is, is really the true answer to all of our problems that we experience. So in light of God's word, why don't we stand together and you can just listen. Um, you can open up your scriptures. You can just listen uh, as, as it's being shared right here. It's a lengthy passage of scripture, but we're just going to read pretty much all of Exodus 16. So that's what I'd like to do right now. So enjoy the story. Before anything else, enjoy the story and put yourself into it. If you've, if you've heard this before, one of the things that I like to do is I like to try to have that exercise where I'm trying to listen to this and saying, Lord, help me to listen to it with, with uh, fresh ears like I'm listening to it for the first time again. And uh, then let's ask God to bless us in, uh, in this passage of Scripture. And uh, there's going to be some, some words and stuff like that. I don't know how to pronounce. Y'all, y'all that happens to you, so I'm just going to go with it. I know I'm a dean of a college and whatnot, but I'm just faking it. I'm just totally faking it. So, all right, let's go. Uh, verse 1, they set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled. Somebody say grumbled. grumbled. Against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not on the sixth day. When they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling. Somebody say grumbling. grumbling. He has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? Somebody might say grumble again. Grumble. All right, there we go. We're getting used to it. And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Verse 9, then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. That's in the evening. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And, there was, and when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall uh, each take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. I like that, stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each, 
And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. All that is left over lay aside to be kept till, till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stank. And there was no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today. For today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. All right, here we go. Verse 27, just listen to this. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. Okay, they weren't listening. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? The Ten Commandments are going to happen later on, so, you know, but... Anyways, this was something that they were instructed to do, and they didn't do it. See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now, the house of Israel called its uh, name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. I, 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 that, that sounds good to me. Uh, Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations so that you may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna, manna, manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The people of Israel ate the manna 40 years till they came to a habitable, a habitable land. They ate manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is the tenth part of an ephah. This is the word of the Lord. You guys go ahead and have a seat. So after reading this passage, I want to simply just address two subjects, okay, for us this morning. And the subjects that I think are coming from this text is, number one, our grumbling, and then number two, God providing. So let's address this first particular subject, our grumbling. And I want to propose a question for you to consider. In fact, before, as I propose a a question for you to consider, I also want you to think of ways in which that you would say, okay, in this case, yes, it is good. The question I want to ask you is this, is it ever good to grumble? I want you to think about that for a second. Is it ever good to grumble? Would there be something if I broke you guys off into pairs, which I won't do right now, and you had an opportunity, would there be something that would emerge all of a sudden and go, oh yeah, definitely that. That's something that I can grumble about, right? That's definitely something I can grumble about. Um, You know, I just went on a very, very long uh, cross-country road trip with my family. It's me and my wife, Abby, and our four kids, and we did it in a truck, three sitting up front and three in the back, and we did a total of 5,300 miles. We went all the way from here to uh, California, and then up to Utah a little bit, and then made our way back. Um, Surprisingly, I didn't really need to grumble about my kids. They did a great job. I was probably the one that was, you know, the the grizzly bear in the the truck. Uh, But I feel like if there's something that I would want to really grumble about, it's the price of gas right now. I mean, can you imagine that for a truck to go 5,300 miles and guys... You go that direction out west, and it is exactly what (laughs) you hear about, especially when you cross that state line going into California. You're like, what just happened? I mean, that price of gas just skyrocketed up, and I feel like, man, if there's ever something good to, to grumble about, surely right now it could be gas prices. That's something I want you to really think about, though, right now. And I'm using that word carefully, grumbling. Is it ever good to grumble? Exodus 16, 2 
which is where we see it show up first in this particular passage. It just says, the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. They grumbled for three reasons. A, they were in the wilderness, okay? Any wilderness people out here? Uh, I, I'm like one of those, those fakers. Like, I always think it's a good idea. I want to go out and do some camping and be out there, and I try my best, but they, uh, I'm not built for the wilderness, all right? I don't know, maybe some of you are. I watched that show. Maybe some of you have watched it alone. It's a really fascinating show, and they, they send people out to go and live alone in the wilderness for as long as they can. One particular season, the winner uh, it's whoever lasts the longest. They're by themselves. The, the winner went for a hundred days by themselves in the wilderness. I'm telling you, uh, it was uh, uh, by day two, because we did some camping on this past trip, um, where I was really, I already had it. So they grumbled because they were A, in the wilderness, B, because they had already actually been wandering a long time it's not a long time when you think of 40 years, but it did say, what did it say? Somewhere it said, uh, uh, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. That sounds like a pretty long time, right? I mean, for me, camping in three days in a camper trailer, I'm starting to grumble, right? This is already uh, a significant amount of time. That's why they were grumbling. And then C, it's because they were hungry, or as many of us can relate, they were hangry, right? Uh, I know we got some people who relate to me. I'm one of those in my house. I'm, I'm in the hangry category. Anybody want to raise your hand and say, that is me. You get me a little bit hungry, I turn from hungry into hangry, and man, people don't want to be around me during that time. It's like those Snickers commercials. Hey, just have a Snickers, right? Relax, right? So they had these reasons for grumbling. Not all of us, but most of us actually hear those reasons, and we think that those are valid reasons to grumble, okay? Wilderness, out for a long time, and being hangry. Oftentimes, we think that we are justified in our grumbling. I have this picture in my head of Harry and Marv in Home Alone, right? Harry and Marv. Rasham, 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 rasham. Come on, guys. That's my favorite Christmas movie. Elf is getting up there close. It's right up to it, but Home Alone still wears the crown for me. I mean, we can, we can discuss the finer points of theology later on, but that's where I, can, uh, I happen to fall. And I've got this picture in my mind that, yeah, of course, oftentimes getting hit with an iron or stepping on something, anything like that, we can certainly be justified in our, you know, we feel it is our noble right to grumble and bicker and complain and mouth off considering the circumstances that we find ourselves in. This is an important theme for uh, this particular chapter. The, the, during the exodus of, pe of the people of Israel from Egypt, they're grumbling. In fact, they grumble in Exodus 15. So we're in Exodus 16 today. They grumble in Exodus 15 about the bitter water. You know, they, they, they grumble about it. That's uh, 15 and cha uh, chapter 15 and verse 24. Uh, they are grumbling in chapter 16 because of their hunger. And uh, kind of, I don't know, in, in some ways it makes sense. They also grumble again in Exodus 17. So that's the very next chapter because of, because of thirst. Uh, chapter 17 and verse 3. Still on their Exodus journey, uh, the people of Israel also grumble in the book of Numbers. They, they grumble in Numbers 14, 14 chapter, chapter 14, verse 2, because of the report of the Nephilim, the big tall ones. And they're like, you, we got to go, go defeat these guys? And they're huge, right? And so they, they decide that they have a moment. And some of us say, yeah, that sounds kind of justifiable to to grumble because of the report of the Nephilim. Then you go into number 16, and, and there's this big rebellion. It's referred to as Korah's Rebellion, right? And they grumble in that particular chapter. And then the response to Korah's Rebellion, we see that God's decisively responding to their grumblings in Numbers chapter 17. It's a common response 
by the people of Israel during the Exodus. It's a common response for many of us today, right? Grumbling's kind of defined as muttering in discontent. Rassum, 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 rassum. Muttering in discontent. One source uh, defines grumbling as murmuring that suggests the malicious, malicious whispering of slander. Murmuring that suggests the malicious whispering of slander. In the New Testament, the parallel word for grumbling is associated with murmuring, indignation, fault finding. Grumbling in the New Testament is mostly connected with the complaining of the Pharisees and the scribes. Right? I heard this quote one time regarding grumbling. Someone once said, I believe in grumbling. It's the politest form of fighting known. So all of us want to get into a good fight. We may not want to go fisticuffs with people. We may not want to go blows with somebody. But we definitely want to have that feeling of expressing our, our angst, our frustration and fault finding and indignation. And so it naturally gravitates us towards that activity, me included, me included. Many of us, I'm willing to say for all of us, we experience this weekly, uh, yeah, daily, daily. Um, daily opportunities to grumble. Some of us try to exercise restraint, but many of us are really unhinged <laughs> when it comes to grumbling. I just want to just say this, okay? This is what I'm confident of, that not only this passage teaches, but I believe that the totality of Scripture teaches us. Grumbling is not good because, A, God does not like it. Let's just start there. Grumbling is not good because God does not like it. It's quite obvious in the Exodus that when grumbling shows up, God doesn't respond in a happy sort of way to it. God's dislike of something should be sufficient for us to not do that thing no matter how justified we may feel. And we live in a culture today that would rather try to learn how to uh, validate it, to justify it, before we obey it. And I would venture to say, especially to those of you who are believers in the house today, be very careful of practicing your faith only on the basis because you validated it with your own reasoning first. We're people of faith. And to be people of faith means that we trust God and we believe Him to be God. We're not God, He is. And so it's important for us to see things, even something as simple and ordinary like grumbling, as like, okay, it's not good because God doesn't like it. But secondly, it's because the Bible also forbids it. Let's go ahead and take it another step further. The Bible forbids it. Philippians 2, 14 and 15 is sufficient enough for me to read right now to help you understand that we should not be people who grumble. It says, do all things without grumbling. I mean, you know what I mean? <laughs> Plain. <laughs> do all, all things. Okay. <laughs> not some things, all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst, look at that, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. This verse implies that a sign of a crooked and twisted generation is grumbling. <laughs> grumbling is often used to pervert the truth. Trying to switch narratives. I think that happens a lot in our culture today, doesn't it? So we need to remember that, that grumbling is not good because the Bible forbids it. But then thirdly, I need to share this with you, that it is a stark contrast to faithfulness. Grumbling is a stark contrast to faithfulness. God heard their cry, that's Exodus 3. He uses Moses to deliver the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt. God uses all these multiple signs and wonders to deliver them. 
but most importantly is the simple fact that God said he would deliver them. He did all those signs. He's doing all those things even as they begin their exodus. But the ultimate thing that the people of Israel need to be hanging their, their hat on is the fact that God said, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to do it. So for the people to grumble against Moses, against Aaron, against God, albeit in, with seemingly justifiable reasons, wondering and being hangry, it's actually, when you grumble, a declaration of faithlessness, not faithfulness. Grumbling is ultimately, I'm not sure I believe you anymore. So when someone feels that they have the opportunity to grumble and yet they don't, when you have it and you don't, you're actually seizing an opportunity to practice faith, to put faith into practice. Peter ends, he said this with regard to grumbling, grumbling neither grumbling against God nor grumbling against God's people is acceptable for those who have been raised in Christ's image. The pattern of behavior exhibited by the Exodus generation must be transcended by those who have partaken of the new Exodus in Christ. You see, scripturally speaking, because I think there's things that like I can express that I don't like, right? I mean, there's things that maybe like gas prices or something like that. We could go on and have a bunch of different topics to think about that we don't like. And in, in truth, some of you have been wronged in vicious ways. Vicious, like really awful ways. You know that, and you've, you know of stories of people who've been really cheated, abused, wronged in a variety of different ways. Scripturally speaking, a grumbling is different from a complaint or a cry. Grumbling is different from a complaint or a cry. An example of a complaint or a cry is Psalm 55. Check it out. Here's what he says in verses 1 through 3. Give ear to my prayer, O God. And hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me. Answer me. I am restless in my complaint. And I moan because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked. For they drop trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. You see, the difference between the grumbling in Exodus 16... And the complaint, the cry in Psalm 55 is seen in actually Exodus 16.3. Remind yourself real quickly of Exodus 16.3. Look at the response of the people of Israel. Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Do you hear the unbelief? Do you hear it? Do you hear their bickering spirit? Their lack of faith in their grumbling? Grumbling, in essence, is taking a complaint too far by taking it to the point of gossip or slander. Grumbling is taking a complaint too far to the point of gossip or slander. That's why we need to, with regard to grumbling, practice avoiding grumbling at all costs. You see, an opportunity to avoid grumbling is an opportunity to increase faith and humility. Already mentioned how grumbling is a stark contrast to faithfulness. Grumbling is a product of faithlessness, not faithfulness. Grumbling is also a stark contrast to humility. In other words, grumbling is a sign of pride. I know it sounds crazy, but it is. When someone grumbles, they think they know better. 
And in several circumstances, maybe with regard to other people and current events, (laughs) you might actually know better. (laughs) It's possible. But when it comes to God, to grumble in any way, shape, or form in relationship to Him is to declare in a prideful way that you know better than God. That's just not possible. You don't know better than God. None of us do. That's why it's a drive towards humility. I pray, I really do. I pray this morning for each and every one of us that conviction falls on all of us regarding the role of grumbling in our lives. I'm not talking about an easy pathway to just eliminate that altogether. I, I would rather tackle this tough subject today, especially because of the current state of just everything in life. I would rather us hit this right now so that we can show the better way. I pray we're driven and motivated to honor God and others in all circumstances so that it shapes how we react to God and to others. So real quickly, I then just want to share with you this second part, okay? It took a long time in the first part. I want to just do this real quickly with the second part because we're talking about our grumbling and God providing. So grumbling's still happening. And look at how God still provides. Isn't that cool? Isn't that gracious? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? That there is grumbling taking place and yet still God provides. They're hungry in the wilderness. God hears them and answers them by providing this bread from heaven. Yeah, hey guys, this is what God does. It's what he does. He provides. God is Jehovah Jireh. He is the God who sees. He is the God who provides. Jehovah Jireh. He saw and he heard the people in Egypt. He responded and he rescued. This is what God does. Some of you this morning are wondering if God will provide. It could be something financial. It could be relationships related to your house, related to your children. Some of you are wondering right now as I'm talking about this, will God provide? Some of you have small matters of concern regarding provisions right now. Some of us have significant Matters of concern regarding provisions. You know God knows? He does. He knows. Do you know he's listening? Take heart. He is. God's listening. And do you know that God has provided already? God may yet provide again, but God has provided already. Regardless of your particular need, you can rest assured that God has already provided. This is why I drive back to Jesus. He has already provided through his son Jesus. I would encourage you as you come back to this passage of Scripture later on in life, that you would always see Exodus 16 and you would immediately see John 6. That you would always see Exodus 16 and it would make your mind just light up with regard to the truth and the truths that are found in John 6. Our God has provided, He has done so through Jesus who is the bread of life. That's what he's done. Our opportunity, and you got to go back and read it. I I wanted to have time, but we're not going to do that right now. If I'd give you an assignment sometime this week, enjoy John chapter 6. Enjoy it. Sit down with a toast, a piece of toast, and make a toast to Jesus because of John 6. Our opportunity right now is to trust and obey. 
not to grumble and complain, albeit when we think we're justified in doing so, because he said he would rescue us. He said that already. Are you trusting him to do that? He's already demonstrated and accomplished that through Jesus, who's become the bread of life that did come down from heaven, that whoever eats of him will not perish, but have life abundant and would have life eternal. Now is the opportunity when you have those moments in life. Today, this coming week, now is the opportunity when those moments show up. And I get it. We're going to want to complain and cry, but be careful about grumbling. Instead of grumbling, use it as an opportunity to increase your faith and your humility. Continue to trust that God will provide because he has and he will. This is why Philippians 4.19 says this. And I'm believing it. I'm praying that even in all of our reasons to really uh, that we truly can believe this. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Exodus chapter 16. Whew, we grumble. I testify not to my self-righteousness. I testify to your righteousness. That I am the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness. And that I am that person and I feel so justified sometimes to be the one that grumbles. After all, I get hungry. After all, all these things take place. But God, as we have legitimate things that take place in our life and, and there are times where we need to cry and at times even complain, help us to be faithful and not take it to a point of grumbling. Increase our faith and humility through everyday moments of life. We believe in you. We believe that, Jesus, you have provided for us. You are our provision. You're Jehovah Jireh. But now we want to put that into practice, trusting you, that you will provide for us. Lord, I pray for the people that are before me right now. I dare not assume I know what they're going through. It could be a really good day. It could be a really bad day. I don't know how people are coming in. It could be an apathetic day. God, I pray for myself as well that collectively we would recognize that, yes, there are so many troubles in this world, but you have overcome the world. And that we want to trust you because you're going to be there for us. We want to believe that. Help us. Thank you for providing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Pastor Brick.